Now I'm just going to move my photo over to the other side of the page and if we do have any trouble with um, uh, the screen freezing I'm actually going to turn off the camera. Alright, so um, away we go, We're talking about otoscopy tonight which is basically looking in your client's ears for those of you that are new to clinic work. The first thing we do is we need to make sure that we have an otoscope that's working. So the otoscope is the implement that we're using to look in someone's ears. Sometimes it's referred to as an oroscope. Now the otoscope has four main parts. Um, it has a light source, so it's got a little globe in there. Um, it has a magnifying glass because when we look down the ear we want to make sure that we can see um, a fair amount of, of the tympanic membrane has a power source, so a battery to drive it, and it has speculum, so which is an interchangeable tip. Um, so you know we don't use the same thing every time we're looking down someone's ear. Alright, the light source. Now the light source to illuminate the ear canal and tympanic membrane is inside the head of the otoscope. Um, the best um, there are a couple of different sort of lamps you can get. Uh, fiber optic is very popular because we don't get any um, reflections off the tympanic membrane um, or any obstructions that might be in the ear canal and it gives us a very nice clear view of the tympanic membrane. Um, that, uh, you can also get a halogen lamp um, and that will give you a whiter brighter light for true tissue colour. So it just depends how big your otoscope is, you know there's lots of little screener ones that you can use. Um, obviously the the better the lamp, um, the um, the more expensive the otoscope. So, it just depends what you're using. They all they all do a fairly good job, but definitely when you've got a um, sorry a better a better light source, you get a much better view of the of the eardrum tympanic membrane. All right. So in order to see the tympanic membrane clearly, we've got there's a magnifying glass placed inside the head of the otoscope. So it's um, it, it'll be just behind this little lens here um, and that, that's good because as I said earlier it will just make the, um, the landmarks that you're looking for on the tympanic membrane a lot easier to see. Now the power source is generally a battery or it is a battery. Um, they are, you can have um, disposable ones or rechargeable ones. Obviously rechargeable ones are better for the environment um, and they just fit into um, the base of the uh, handle of the otoscope. Now um, this one here is a disposable battery. Um, rechargeable ones you generally at the end of the day you sit them in a little cradle and they um, charge overnight. Oh, don't forget people if you've got questions as I go just put them in the chat pod and Monica will uh, answer them. You have um, speculum as I said before that goes on the tip of the um, head of the um, otoscope. Generally people these days use disposable ones because of um, for infection control um, but uh, for envir to be more environmentally friendly we should um, use reusable ones in clinics where we have full autoclaving infection control facilities. And with reusable ones you can actually get different size uh, tips and the bigger size the better because uh, you'll be able to see way more when you look down the um, ear canal. This um, one here on the right is a disposable tip and these ones here are different um, reusable ones. Okay then we have a procedure and we're very very strict on our procedure for otoscopic examination um, and, and when you get to the stage where you are sitting your practical examination uh, we expect you to be using the correct procedure when looking down someone's ear and it is, it is a safety issue um, because you don't want to hurt your client and if you don't do it the right way and they sneeze or, or slip or you slip or whatever you can um, ram the uh, speculum into the um, external autremiatus, the ear canal and that can draw blood and cause a lot of pain. Um, now when, when we're looking in someone's ear we want to check the size, the position and the symmetry of the pinna. So when you look at one ear and then the other when you look, look at one ear and then the other you need to actually see if they are both similar because you might see something quite unusual down one ear when you're looking down the first ear. Um, um, but then when you look at the other ear you see that that's, that's the way that, that person's ears are made. So always make sure that you check that. When you're looking for symmetry of, of the pinna on the head um, 
some people who have syndrome, one ear might sit higher than the other or they might have what's called fissures um, somewhere, either which are like little hot holes or, or pock marks they look like sometimes underneath the pinna, which is you know the, the bit on your ear you can see, and that sometimes can be indicative of um, someone who had may have had um, I've gone completely blank. Um, what's that, Monica? Syndrome. Yeah, a syndrome, but I'm um, thinking of one. Um, cleft palate. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> complete blank there. Um, so things like that can um, can show up on the outside of the of the pinna. So look for that. You're also going to be looking for scars and skin lesions around the pinna or on the pinna. Um, they can indicate previous trauma or injury. Um, you might also see something that looks a bit suspicious like uh, melanoma so you, you must report on that on, and anything that looks uh, unusual. Inspect for skin conditions, redness or discharge. A lot of people get dermatitis in and around their ears and that can le lead to a condition called otitis externa um, which we'll talk about later so um, always have a look for that and because if they do have a skin condition their ears will be quite sore. Um, you're, you're going to palpate around the um, tragal area of the pinna, which is, if I just pull this off my ear, the tragal area is the kind of pointy bit that sticks out. Um, so you're going to palpate around that area and, and notice if the, if the client winces or, or mentions any discomfort. And this is before we even move to look in the ear. Here's a picture of um, it's actually Monica palpating around um, uh, Veronica's ear here. So um, you can see that she's just going to be pressing gently around the outside of the ear and she'll um, and note any change of expression on the client's face. Um, also we're looking behind the ear and if people have had, a, had any surgery, major surgery on their ear, what they tend to do is um, cut around this section pull the pin up away from the head and enter the ear canal from there. So you'll see a nice um, scar following the, the shape of the base of the pin up there if they have had surgery. Alright, holding the otoscope. This is really important. We, um, we want, expect everyone to hold it the correct way. Sorry. Um, we're going to hold the pin up, uh, sorry, hold the otoscope um, like you would a pencil, so you use a pencil grip and you use it in your preferred hand. Some people are really clever, they're ambidextrous and can use both hands to look in um, the ears. I'm very right handed so I use my right hand for both ears. Um, and you just need to practice and see what you find comfortable. Has anyone had much of a, has anyone had a go at, at otoscopy at all? Have they had a, had a chance to hold an otoscope? Brenda has, good. Kim has, yes. Good, Nala, that's good that you had to go on the weekend. Excellent, Barry. And Obega has as well. Did did um did you all specifically use just one hand or did you swap between hands? Swapped hands, Brenda. You're very clever. And it's like me, just one hand. Barry, you told try both hands. So that's not a bad thing. Um, as long as you use the correct grip and you, and you um, that's correct, Nala, that's that's right. Uh, and I'll just show you on the next slide of what, what that means. Oh, sorry, the one after. And the bigger uses both hands, great. Okay, so now we're getting to the stage we're about to look in someone's ear. So we're going to pull the pinna up and back. This will straighten the ear canal, allowing for easy inspection of the ear canal and tympanic membrane. That's in an adult. In a child, you actually pull the um, the pinna up, up and down, sorry, back and down, because the um, the ear canal on a child uh, actually has a different slope to on an adult because our faces are longer and our our um, ear canal sort of slope down and in a bit. Where children, their faces have are still quite small, so that um, it's a, a bit more horizontal. All right, now we need to stabilise our hand and this is to ensure you don't harm the client by slipping. So you must anchor your hand with, uh, you must anchor the hand with that's holding the otoscope. And this is done by bracing your little finger or the side of your hand on either the cheek or the mastoid, depending on which ear you are inspecting. So let's have a look at that. 
we can see here we're looking in a person's left ear on this on this slide here and um, it's Monica's hand again she's holding it in her right hand she's got her pinky resting on the client's cheek and so what what if the client moves Monica will move with her she won't move against the client now if we go to the left ear you can see that the her little finger is actually up and in behind her ear and it's resting on the mastoid process behind the ear. Um, again she's still able to pull the pinna up and back um, and but looks in that way. All right now we're going to insert the speculum and we've got to do it gently. Don't just rush in there because you know there might be a big clot of wax right at the opening of the of the ear canal and you don't want to push it in any further so you just um, go in gently and you manoeuvre the speculum around the canal so you can see as much of the tympanic membrane as possible which means you might need to change the position of your hand or your head don't try and move the person's head you you move your hand and your head to view the spec um, to view as much of the tympanic membrane as you can just going to change screens now go to the next one Oh, that's a good question. Yes, you should ask the client to sit still. Um, the, the reason, you know, we talk about the safety of anchoring your hand, um, running through your ear canal is your vagus nerve. Now, this has never happened to me, but I've heard of it happening to someone else. And um, um, basically the person uh, looking in the ear, they touch the side of the ear canal with the speculum and it actually touched their vagus nerve and that person went into a dead faint which and they sort of they sort of slipped away from, from onto the ground now if the person hadn't been anchoring their hand properly um, they would have um, injured that person as they went down okay, my screen's frozen can't get it to move on oh, you've moved on oh, okay all right um, all right, Monica says she can see the next screen. So I'm just just going to make. Hang on, just want to check something. Right. We did want to actually show you a photo story of um, the procedure of someone looking in the ear, but it wouldn't work on the screen tonight. So you can view this if you go to the O10 Audiometry Wiki space, go to the Otoscopy page, and um, it's um, it's a little video story of um, the cor correct procedure of looking in someone's ear. So have a look at that when you've got time, if you haven't already. All right. So a normal tympanic membrane. A normal tympanic membrane we're going to be looking for um, certain landmarks if you like. Now a landmark is um, uh, uh, something that is that we, we want to see on a healthy tympanic membrane. Now you, we, you'll be looking for the handle of the malleus. Uh, you'll be looking for, I've just got a sneeze. Hang on. <coughs> Sorry about that. Alright so um, we're going to look at some pictures of, of the tympanic membrane in a minute. Hopefully I'll actually get to see it. My screen's not showing it. Um, sorry. Can you just excuse me for a minute? I'm just going to close this screen and go back into it because um, I can't actually see what you guys are seeing at the moment. Just hang on a tick.
Okay, my audio's back now, I think. So I will just explain all that again. I'm sorry about that. All right, so we have no camera, though. Now, um, on, on a healthy tympanic membrane, you're looking to see the lateral process of the malleus, or the handle of the malleus, which goes down the centre of the tympanic membrane. It's a white, bony um, structure. You will see the light reflex, or the cone of light, and where they join together is called the umbo. And the umbo is the greatest point of retraction of the tympanic membrane. And it's on a healthy tympanic membrane, it's centrally located. Um, you will the, the bottom sort of three quarters is called the pars tensor, and that's where the skin is quite tight on the tympanic membrane. The top quadrant is um, a bit looser, the skin, and that's called the pars flaccida, or sometimes referred to as the attic. You'll also see it's not marked on here, but you'll see this line going around the bottom of the tympanic membrane where the membrane joins the ear canal. That's called the annulus, and that's an important thing to note as well. The um, colour of the tympanic membrane should be um, translucent. It's not transparent. Can anyone tell me why it's not transparent? Three layers of skin, that's right, Brenda. And the, the external layer, the, the layer that um, that's uh, closest to us as we look into the ear canal, is continuous with the skin of the ear canal. The um, third layer is um, continuous with the, um, the skin in the middle ear cavity, and that, that's actually the mucous membrane. And the middle layer is a fibrous tissue, and that's what enables the eardrum or tympanic membrane to vibrate. And the malleus is embedded into, uh, into that fibrous tissue. Um, the, the, the whole, I guess, look of the tympanic membrane, um, you're looking at, at the integrity of the tympanic membrane to see how healthy it is. And integrity just means that it's the right colour, it's sitting in the right position, and if it's got good integrity, then it's a healthy tympanic membrane. Now, we can see here on the left ear, here's our cone of light. Can everyone see that okay, that little triangle of light there? And that's just the light reflex reflecting back from the otoscope. All right, that's good. And you'll notice on the left ear, it's in a different position to on the right ear. Um, and that's because of the way that our ear canal is shaped on, our le on the left and right side of our head. So um, to know that you know, you've, your eardrum's kind of sitting in the right place, when you're looking down the left ear, the uh, cone of light should be, if you can think of the, the face of the tympanic membrane as the face of a clock. And on the dial, the cone of light should be between 6 o'clock and 9 o'clock for the left ear. And for the right ear, it should be between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock. So that's a good way to remember um, uh, the position of the cone of light telling if it's healthy. If it's, if it's all broken up or it's not sitting in the right place, then um, something's abnormal about the eardrum that you're looking at. We can see here the nice handle of the malleus. And, and here's, the, here's the point where the, the cone of light joins the malleus. What's that point called? Remember? The umbo, excellent. And what does the umbo signify? Greatest point of retraction, excellent. Excellent. So that should be pretty much central, um, so that's good. And on here we can actually see a tiny shadow of the incus. You will never see a stapes. In, when you look down someone's ear, a healthy eardrum. Uh, I've seen, sorry, I shouldn't say never. Um, it is highly unlikely you will see a stapes, so please don't ever state that you do. The only time I ever saw one was when I looked, I was actually a student, and I looked down someone's ear. They had no eardrum, they'd been involved in a blast, and all the ossicles were just hanging loose. Um, and they weren't connected because that, of the traumatic explosion that, that they were exposed to, um, blew out the eardrum and, and the ossicles were just hanging down, so it was quite an unusual thing to see. Is anyone else getting an echo? Is it just Liz? And 
if I can turn my microphone down a bit. Right, well, I'll leave it as it is then. Um, all right, so that's the left and the right here. Let's see what we've got next. All right, so we're going to start having a, having a look at what we might see down the ear. And one of the things that you will see in nine, nine cases out of ten is wax in the ear canal. Most ears will have wax in the canal and it's there for a reason. It's healthy to have wax. So when you get a client who stresses out that they might have wax in their ear or they try and clean it out all the time, please assure them that it's normal. It's there for a reason. It's there to keep um, uh, foreign bodies and insects out and um, it, it moves out generally um, on it, of its own, you know, as part of the process of chewing and um, talking. I always say, because I talk a lot, I don't get a lot of wax in my ears because my jaws are always moving and the wax is always moving out. Um, but it, it is it is a healthy thing and um, that people should sort of leave well enough alone, otherwise they might end up pushing it further in, which is bad. Wax can vary in colour from white to black and varying shades in between. Some people think, um, well there is a little bit of evidence that show that the colour of your wax um, can indicate how much um, how much of a meat eater you are. The darker it is, the more meat you eat. Apparently, red meat you eat. Um, although I have um, seen papers where um, the, uh, how high your cholesterol is will also have an impact on the colour of your wax. So I don't know anything definitively on that. Monica, do you know anything about that? Do you know anything definitive about the colour of your wax relating to cholesterol levels? Um, no, all I'm really aware of is no, not working. I'll, shall I tap? Okay. Right. Monica's just going to type her answer in. Nala, I'll talk about the difference between including wax and impacted wax in a minute. And Barry, different races have different colour of wax. No, not really. Um, it's all pretty much that goldy colour to black. Um, uh, it's it's more how much oil is in in the wax where, and and how um, dried out it is, to, um, which, which impacts mostly on the colour. So we can see in this diagram here that um, we've got uh, on the left hand side we've got a sort of yellowy wax on the outside and into a darker brown and on this side it's almost a bit red around the outside but quite dark in the middle. Um, now this wax on the left hand side is neither occluding or impacted however Nala if this if this colour wax completely filled the canal I would think that it was probably impacting because impacting it's usually dry and hard and no sound is, is getting through at all and it's and there's probably quite a lot of wax and the client would not be able to remove it by themselves when it's impacted and you'll probably find it's causing quite a significant um, sorry uh, it is causing a, a noticeable hearing loss for the client. You can see here we can um, I can see just past the wax so it's not occluding and I can actually see one of the landmarks. Can anyone tell me what landmark I'm seeing in the background there? The malleus, perfect. That's great, Abega. That's exactly what we're seeing. And maybe if I could kind of get my speculum a little bit around the wax, not without touching and pushing it further in, I might be able to see something else. I might get to see the annulus. Um, and I might get to see the cone of light, but at the moment I can't. But yes, it is definitely the malleus that we're seeing there. And now on this ear, it is definitely occluding wax because I can't I can't find a gap around the outside. But to me, the the wax looks quite moist, so I would think that it would come out quite easily with some eardrops. It's not it doesn't have a hard look about it. it. Looks 
quite soft um, and uh, it, it might be causing a very mild hearing loss but I don't think it would be too bad. Um, yeah, I think that wax would come out easily um, with some drops um, over a, you know, a week or so and then uh, retest the person's hearing and see, see what happens. Now another um, condition we can see quite regularly in the ear is something called exostosis, which is, um, um, hang on a sec, okay, so um, we're, with exostosis it's a bony growth in the ear canal. Now I guess a good analogy is to think about um, a person that um, you know might be a gardener and they're using their hands a lot to dig use a spade and after a while the hands will blister and then those blisters will form into calluses and that's to protect the skin. Well exostosis is, is, is thought to be there as a protective mechanism for the ear canal and the eardrum um, and, and it's when an ear is exposed to a lot of cold water these bony growths seem to build up in the ear. So if you look down someone's ear and you see um, these little bumps so they're continuous with the um, with the ear canal, and they come out, and you know sometimes they can uh, almost close off the ear canal, and you're not getting much space down to the eardrum. So they're often seen in swimmers, um, and you know you can sometimes be a bit clever, and you look down someone's ear, and you can see they have exostosis, and um, you might tell them, oh, do you swim a lot? And I wonder how you know, and it's because they've got this um, these this exostosis there. Um, a fungal infection can also develop sort of around the growth and that's because water gets in and it but it doesn't get out very well because it's pretty hard to get out around the, the bumps in the ear and so um, they, they don't dry off very well so we might get a bit of a fungal infection. Uh, a, a lot of exostosis needs to be removed surgically um, and it used to be a very very painful operation but these days they use laser, laser surgery and it's a, a lot less invasive and um, uh, painful for the client. All right, another condition that's quite common is otitis externa. Remember I said earlier that people with dermatitis might be prone to something called otitis externa? And that's um, uh, what, what otitis externa is, is an inflammation or infection of the ear canal. So if you, if you do have some with dermatitis or eczema in their ears and they scratch a lot, it might become red and inflamed and an infection build up. And what can happen is that the canal can become blocked or partially blocked from the infection or even if they might have a bit of discharge from the infection. And when that happens and you look down someone's ear, it just looks like it's been narrowed a bit. You might see some red swelling as well. And this makes the tympanic membrane quite difficult to see. Um, it's generally treated with antibiotic drops or sometimes the doctor might put what's called a wick in there, an antibiotic wick and um, that just sits in the ear and that antibiotics is, is in the wick and it just sort of helps clear out the ear. Another thing that you might see is something called tympanosclerosis, very common again. And this is a condition where the tympanic membrane has calcium plaques which form as a result of old infection. So you look down someone's ear, it, the colour is fine, the position is fine, but you might see a white line somewhere, just like any scarring on your body. It, it, it's exactly that kind of look about it. Um, and uh, it's generally as a result of people who've had you know, uh, multiple ear inf infections before. And it's really of no significance, it doesn't cause much of a hearing loss unless the plaques bind the malleus with the ear canal um, and this stops the eardrum from vibrating. So that is when it becomes quite significant. Uh, now I'm going to show you a picture of an ear that has um, a perforation and severe tympanosclerosis involving the eardrum and the middle ear. So we can see here, I've got a perforation here, but you can see how it's kind of whitish behind, um, next to it. Now that's the tympanosclerosis and um, it's very advanced and uh, it, it, our amalleus, <coughs> this one part of it here, looks like it's coming around the back and our eardrum has attached itself to it. So um, we've got a couple of pathologies <coughs> happening in here. Um, so this person's going to have their hearing affected and will need some medical treatment, definitely. A very common condition is a retracted tympanic membrane and for those of you that have done a little bit on um, 
tympanometry, it's uh, it's where it, it's when you've got significant negative pressure in the middle ear, and this is caused from eustachian tube dysfunction. So that's where eustachian tube is meant to open and close with um, talking and swallowing and yawning. Um, it's got a little valve in it, but sometimes that valve can close and stay closed, and then the um, uh, what it does is then um, sucks back the eardrum, uh, pulling the landmark, landmarks out of position. Long-term long negative pressure will cause collapse of the eardrum and eventually a retraction pocket formation. So we're going to see that now. Um, we can see the landmarks well, or the bones behind quite clearly um, because the eardrum has just adhered itself to, um, to the bones. Um, Got a bit of tympanosclerosis happening here, and here's another one. You know, we can see quite clearly the handle of the malleus and the um, incus, and we've got a little pocket of air happening there as well. Okay, that's the end of that one. I'm just going to change pages again. Sorry, it's just taking a little while to load. But if you're asking lots of um, interesting questions, that's good. Keep them coming. We've just got a few more um, pathologies to have a look at, what we might see when we look down in here. slow tonight aren't we? Okay, otitis media, very common problem especially in children and this is when an infection in the middle ear space occurs and it's referred to as otitis media, media infection in the middle ear um, and this happens because fluid accumulates when the mucous membrane lining of the middle ear becomes inflamed and the eustachian tube blocks so we've got a the valve is closed in the eustachian tube and the fluid you know when, you, when you've got a space that's um, surrounded by mucous membrane, it's always wet and um, if uh, that wetness has got nowhere to go, it builds up. And the condition can be called acute, serous or chronic suppurative. Um, it's often referred to as gluey when it um, really gets going. Now acute otitis, otitis media is uh, the ears get congested, congested like with a cold or something. Um, or an infection starting up um, and you might have a little bit of mild discomfort initially and your ears might feel like they're continually popping. Symptoms um, can often resolve with the underlying um, infection but if the middle ear becomes contaminated with bacteria, pus and pressure in the middle ear can result so we're getting a build up of fluid behind the eardrum. Earache or otalgia occurs and the pain can be severe and continuous so in a child, you know, they might be screaming and pulling on their ears. And it's often accompanied by a fever of um, uh, above 39 degrees Celsius. So they're quite unwell. Um, and then it may result in a perforation because the eardrum is actually not being sucked back. It's usually it's at this stage being um, pushed forward and, um, and becomes quite distended. So um, there's a lot of pain involved from the, from the eardrum's uh, swelling. Once it bursts, the pain goes. Um, um, sometimes the infection can in, invade the mastoid space and you, the, the person can develop mastoiditis. Um, and in very rare cases, this can uh, further spread to cause meningitis. So here's some lovely pictures of otitis media. We've got a nice little um, redness. No, you cannot see your... Um, landmarks at all. You've got the eardrum pushing forward. This one here you can see yellow bubbles. We've got a nice little yellowy kind of pussy infection forming here. So it's not very pretty. When you look down an ear and you see that, you know it's abnormal. You don't have to diagnose what's going on. You just need to know when something doesn't look right. Serous otitis media or otitis media with effusion. It's when the negative pressure builds up in the middle ear from the eustachian tube dysfunction. 
um, but you may not have an infection with it. Over weeks and months, the middle ear fluid can become very thick and glue-like, which is where the term blue ear comes from. And often parents, if the child, if there's no infection, there's no pain or fever. So they're just wanting to know why, you know, they, they didn't notice their child had a hearing loss and they've got this thick glue in there. Well, if they're not complaining of any pain, then it may go up unnoticed, um, as it did in my daughter. So, and I'm an audiologist and I missed it um, because she didn't have an infection with it. So you might get an eardrum that looks sort of kind of kind of glassy. You can see the kind of light here is broken up, so there's some, there's something stopping that from looking correct. This is the uh, handle of the malleus is very prominent, so we have got some retraction here. This is an older picture; it's not as clear, but we've got some we've got some fluid there, and it's looking very yellowy because the glue is quite thick. Right, chronic separative otitis media occurs with a perforation in the tympanic membrane and active bacterial infection within the middle ear space for several weeks. So we've got fluid but we've got bacteria and we've got a perforation and you've got discharge. Okay, so that may be evident in the ear canal and it's more common with poor eustachian tube dysfunction. And here's a nice picture of it. We can see that it's very wet looking, very wet looking perforation. Um, the eardrum, no landmarks, just looks pretty yucky. So that one's straight up to the doctor. Um, a myringotomy is an operation that will um, um, relieve some of these problems and serous otitis media will sometimes need this surgical intervention to remove the fluid and aerate the middle ear space. The procedure is called a myringotomy. And a grommet tube, um, some of you may have heard about that, is placed in the tympanic membrane. The doctor goes in, puts a little slice in the TM um, sucks out any goo that's in there and puts this tiny little tube in there. And it's a simple procedure, uh, day stay operation, and the grommet grows out within six to 18 months. And it's very effective. Here's some pictures of some grommets. This little tube here, this one's still well and truly in the um, eardrum. We can still see the malleus. Um, this one here, it's at the front of the canal. It's got a bit of wax around the outside of it and it's actually extruded. So it's come out and it's um, probably about to fall out. Um, of the person's ear. Perforations, another common thing, and these can be caused by any number of things. Um, uh, rupturing of the tympanic membrane is the most common. You can People can get foreign bodies in their ear and they may pierce the tympanic membrane or a trauma to the head or ear can lead to a perforation. So often people that are in you know, a fight, you get punched in the head, they might have blood coming out of their ear, they've probably got a perforation. Perforations can occur in any part of the eardrum. Ones that are in the central or in the middle are deemed as safe perf perforations. They tend to heal a lot, lot more quickly and, um, um, and, uh, and, and they actually do heal. It usually takes about four to six weeks. However, if you get a perforation on the annulus, and these are often called marginal or in the attic, which is the pars flaccida, they're deemed as unsafe perforations because they, they, it's a lot more difficult for those perforations to heal. So here we've got um, two, two perforations. This one's a nice central one. Um, sorry, that's fine. Um, so it's, it's a central one and um, it's a big perforation. Um, but it's flaccid up the top and it's nowhere near that. But on this side here, we can see our perforation, and it's right on the marge on, on the annulus, so it is a marginal perforation. And what happens is debris can get caught in there and cause another condition, which we're going to talk about in a tick. So that we, we if we see a perforation that's in this section, like on the annulus anywhere, or up in the pars flaccida, the attic area, you need to report that. Okay, here's another one. Here's a, here's a perforation, the bottom right quadrant perforation, and we've got a bit of wax caught in it. That, that generally shouldn't be a problem. Um, if you can see we've got some vascular, vascularization, sorry, vascularization of the top part of the tympanic membrane. So it's still looking pretty red and yucky. So it may be a, no, it's not wet though, I don't know. Does that look like a, a recent um, perforation to you, Monica? What do you think? I wouldn't say it was too recent. Yeah, it is, it is dry. 
um, but maybe there's, we've still got a bit of an infection happening up yeah. the top. Could just be a bit of retraction, which is where that, that Yeah, Monica just said it could be a bit of retraction happening there, that vascularisation. So, um, yeah, just whenever you see a perforation, just have a really good look at it and make some notes on what you see and report that to the doctor. Now, a cholesteatoma is, is a problem that uh, a hole in the eardrum can, that doesn't clear up can, uh, can lead to. Um, it can be a skin cyst caused by a long-standing retraction pocket of the tympanic membrane in the middle ear, or it can be a, a gathering of the debris into the, into the middle ear from where the, the perforation is sitting. That's not healing. So this, the cyst um, slowly erodes bone and can cause facial paralysis, hearing loss, dizziness, and if left, if left untreated can slowly erode into the brain cavity. So they're not nice cholesteatomas. Some of them can be quite aggressive and grow quite quickly. They are a tumour, but they are benign. So once, they, once you can get rid of it, it's not going to grow back. Um, as long as it's all of it's taken. Um, so the cholesteatomas are generally surgically removed with a mastoidectomy operation. They look got eardrum around it, but can you you can see these little bubbly growth things here? It just doesn't look pretty at all. And in this ear here. The growth is so big, it's filling the middle ear cavity. Can you, you all see that white sort of tumourish growth there? And it's probably started up here in this um, unresolved attic perforation. I mean, that looks like a bit of wax over the top, but I would say that that's probably where it started growing from. Not a very pretty uh, thing at all, cholesteatomas. So we've, we've mentioned a few different um, pathologies that uh, people can have. Um, as Monica said, yeah, cholesteatomas are often very smelly. Um, uh, you know, when you see one, you, especially if it's been there for a little while, you really will notice it because they are not attractive at all. So in summary for otoscopy, um, where we've got to make sure that our light is working, so we've, you know, our battery is well charged, and we select the largest size speculum possible. We're going to check externally around the pinna to make sure that it's not sore um, before we start looking into the ear. We're also going to anchor our hand before we begin inspection, so as we don't um, hurt the client in any way. We manoeuvre the otoscope gently to visualise the entire tympanic membrane. We're not moving their head; we're moving the speculum, the otoscope and your head. We're going to locate the landmarks. Uh, in particular, look for the malleus, the cone of light and the umbo. We're checking for the integrity of the tympanic membranes, with me membrane, which means the colour, the position and the visibility of the landmarks. And we're going to note any abnormalities. We're not doctors. We're not diagnosing. We don't have to say, oh, I saw a fluid line. This means that. Or I saw bubbles and that must mean X, Y and Z. In the beginning, when we're starting to look down ears, just know the difference between a normal and an abnormal eardrum. And if you see something abnormal, write it down. Okay? Any questions on that? Waiting to see if anyone's making Carhartt's notch. No, no, Carhartt's notch is um, something that's actually a phenomena that occurs on the audiogram when we're testing someone's hearing. Um, and what it is is an artifactual result of the bone conduction giving a sensory neural loss in, an oto, uh, in a client that has otosclerosis, which is a middle ear condition. But otosclerosis is an overcalcification of the middle ear bones. And when you look down someone's ear, you won't be able to see that. Um, that's, no one can visualise that because you've got a healthy, usually a healthy eardrum in front of it. Um, and we, we can't see um, any overcalcification of the bones. And it generally occurs on the stapes first anyway. 
and uh, what happens is if someone has otosclerosis they have a conductive or middle ear hearing loss show up on an audiogram um, except at 2000 hertz where a sensory neural loss will show but if they get their um, otosclerosis, otosclerosis surgically, surgically repaired by putting in a, um, a prosthetic device called a, um, a stapedectomy is, is sorry the name of the operation where they put a prosthetic device in place of the um, compromised stasis, the stapes, when you retest them, that um, uh, sensory neural loss will disappear. So it's just an artifactual result that happens only in the condition of otosclerosis. So it's not something that you'll see when you look down the ear. Um, Barry, you use the largest um, speculum uh, to, so you can see as much as you possibly can when you look down an ear. Uh, it's just to give a, a, a better view. Yes, there are some excellent um, videos on YouTube of stapedectomy operations. Um, uh, so please have a look at those. Um, yeah, Nala, the um, the other the bony growths we looked at are called exostoses, and they rarely cause a hearing loss at all unless they are completely covering um, the ear canal. And if they do, there'll be a straight conductive hearing loss. There'll be no sensory neural component at all. Very good questions, guys. These are excellent questions. Anyone else got questions? Barry's got one coming. No more questions? Okay, well if there's no more questions, um, I'll stop the recording.